Let's all turn our Bibles this afternoon, first hour, to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. I'm preaching both hours today. For first hour today, I have a message about the true gospel of the true salvation that saves the true saints of God. It will actually be somewhat of an expository message through this chapter in Peter's first epistle, which really as a testimony to Peter's calling as an apostle, is, I believe without doubt, one of the most doctrinally and theologically rich chapters in the Bible, 1 Peter chapter 1. And when I say I have a message about the true gospel of true salvation, I say that because there are many so-called gospels circulating in the world today that claim to be Christian, but that in fact have nothing whatsoever to do with the true Christian faith that was founded by the Lord Jesus Christ and his chosen apostles, and that therefore will not save anybody from eternal destruction. And when I say I have a message about the true gospel that saves the true saints of God, I'm not talking about those relatively few false saints that are awarded a special title of sainthood and recognition for their loyal service to the Catholic Church and the Pope. The fact is that except for Christ's apostles and a few others, most of those whom the Catholic Church has venerated as saints, which practice began in about 375 A.D., had no knowledge of the true gospel or of true salvation. Such was the case, for instance, with Catholic theologian and venerated hero of the Catholic Church, known to many as St. Augustine, also known as Augustine of Hippo. And now and then you'll even hear Protestant preachers on Moody Radio cite to quotes from so-called St. Augustine in very glowing terms every now and then, completely ignorant of the fact that Augustine of Hippo was the man who in the early 5th century actually adopted and popularized the 3rd century Gnostic heretic Origen's method of reducing the Bible to allegory, spiritualizing the text, converting it to metaphor, so that he could formulate the Catholic Church's dogma that the Catholic Church itself is the exclusive kingdom of God on earth with the Bishop of Rome as the usurper of Christ's throne and its only rightful king over all the earth. And Augustine also formulated the Catholic Church's doctrine of what it called just warfare so that it could hunt down and put to death over the ages millions of the true saints of God who followed the scriptures alone and who therefore rejected both papal authority and the Catholic Church itself. The Lord Jesus said, By their fruit shall you know them. And by Augustine's fruit, by the heresy that he preached, and by the blood of the true saints of God that he has on his hands, we can easily say that uh, so-called St. Augustine was no true saint of God, no matter what the Catholic Church or the Pope says. To the contrary, the New Testament uses that word saint both to identify and also to describe or to characterize all, and that means every, truly saved, regenerated, born-again child of God. And that means that if you today are saved, then you are a saint right now already. All right, You don't have to wait until you die to get there. It's not a special award bestowed only upon special Christians recognized for doing special works in the kingdom. All of those who have been redeemed and saved from their sins and who are therefore born again and heaven-bound, all of us are called to be saints. Uh, for example, in the opening of Paul's letter to the Christians at Rome, he says as follows in Romans 1, verse 7, he said, To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says, I'm writing this letter to all of you who are in the church at Rome, all of you who are beloved of God, and you are all called to be saints, is what Paul says there. He opened his letter to the church at Corinth in much the same way. He said, 1 Corinthians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother. Verse 2, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, quote, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, sanctified means you're a saint, called to be saints, Paul says, with all that in every place. All that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father. We see it all through the New Testament. In all of the 62 times that that word saint appears in the New Testament, we see that all true Christians, all those who are truly saved, 
who've been called out of the darkness of this world and into the glorious light of the gospel, who have been brought to a point of repentance uh, from their life of sin, and who have placed their faith in the cleansing blood of the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, and who thereby have become born again, as Jesus said, regenerated, uh, new creatures in Christ. All such true Christians are referred to in the New Testament as saints. And much unlike the false saints of the Catholic Church, we don't have to wait until we die to achieve sainthood status. We become saints at the moment of salvation, the moment we are born again. That word saint or saints, to define it, occurs exactly, actually, 101 times in the King James Bible, 62 times in the New Testament, only 39 in the Old. In the Old Testament, the word is translated from the Hebrew word kodesh, which actually, that word actually occurs 470 times in the Old Testament, but it's only translated as saint or saints 39 times. And it's only done so when the context is clear that that word is in reference either to God's people or in four places to angels referred to as saints. Every other time that word kodesh appears in the Old Testament 430 times, it is simply translated as holy because saint means holy. And so every time you see that word holy in the Old Testament, whether in reference to holy men or holy ground or holy convocation, holy place, it's always translated from that same word, Kodesh, as God says of his people in Exodus 22:31, And ye shall be holy men unto me. And as God's saints, we are all to be holy men unto God. That's what we're called to be. The same, of course, is true in the New Testament where that word saint or saints occurs 62 times. The New Testament is translated from the Greek word hagios. And much like the Old Testament word kadesh, the New Testament word hagios is translated 270 times simply as holy. And so that word saint, both Old and New Testament, is synonymous with the word holy. The saint, God's saints are God's holy ones. And therefore, those whom God has called to be saints, that's all of us, his saints, God's children, his redeemed, are also all called to be holy. We are all called to be holy, not just a select few. Every one of us, we're all called to be holy. That word holy means to be sanctified. It means to be separated and set apart for a special purpose. And that purpose is to be separated and set apart from sin and from sinners. God has called us out of this world to be a special people set aside for him, for his purpose. There is no true Christian who has not already been declared to be a saint. And therefore, by definition, there is no true Christian who has not also been called to be holy. That's why the Apostle Peter says here in verse 15 of 1 Peter chapter 1, But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. And by the way, we need to bear in mind that that word conversation, as it appears in the King James Bible, means much more than the way we use that word today. Far more than the way we speak and talk. It means our conduct, the way we act, the things we do, the way we conduct ourselves. Peter says here that our entire lifestyle is to be defined by the virtue of holiness. That's what he's saying here. Our lifestyle is to be defined by the virtue of separation from sin, separation from the evils of this world, and also separation from non-Christians who by their very nature are in rebellion against God just as we were at one time. As, as Jude says in our memory passage for today, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. So Peter says here, But as he which hath called you is holy, so ye be holy in all manner of conversation. And then he says in verse 16, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. God has called us to be holy. Jesus said, Be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. We're to be holy because God is holy. According to church historian Eusebius, who lived from 265 A.D. till about 340, the authenticity and the authorship of this epistle by the Apostle Peter has never really been in question. It was received without controversy from the early days of the church and cited actually by many ancient Christian writers 
Some have said it was written in about 45 A.D. as the earliest of all the epistles, but that's doubtful, actually, since Peter tells us he's writing from Babylon and rather than from Jerusalem, which is where he was an elder of the church. And also since Peter speaks of the end of all things being at hand in chapter 4 and of the fiery trial just coming on, the Christians spread throughout the empire and of judgment beginning at the house of God. And so it's more likely it was written in about 64 to 65 A.D. uh, when tensions were mounting then between Rome and the Jews of Judea and Jerusalem's destruction was drawing near, probably written about 64 or 65. And that also explains why Peter was writing from Babylon. And that, by the way, Peter says writing from Babylon, is not to be spiritually reinterpreted as a code name for Rome, as the Catholic Church has done to say that Peter was its first pope, that he moved to Rome. There's no evidence Peter ever moved to Rome. At the time of Peter's writing, actually, Babylon was still a thriving metropolis, And in fact, there were still more Jews living in Babylon at that time than there were in Judea. Historically, ancient Babylon remained a significant city till about 400 A.D. when it began to dwindle down to what became a small village. And then it finally disappeared in about 1400 A.D. And so 1 Peter is a general epistle that was written to all Christians in general rather than to any particular church. It was intended to be copied and disseminated to various churches throughout the empire. And so Peter tells us here in verse 1 exactly who he's writing to. Verse 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. He says, verse 2, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. Peter doesn't say here like Paul that he's writing to the saints scattered throughout the empire. Instead, he very interestingly here uses the word strangers. That's a great word, however, that very appropriately describes what Christians are supposed to be as the true saints of God. We have been called out of this world. We have been indwelt by the Holy Ghost and given a new nature in order to, so that we can obey and serve the Lord Jesus. And as such, we are no longer of this world. Peter points that out right up front in this letter. Just as the Lord Jesus said to him and the other apostles, as they were gathered together in that upper room in John chapter 15, Jesus said in verse 19 of that chapter, If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because Jesus said, Ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. And so here Peter says that the same is true of us also. That wasn't just to those 12 or those 11 that were there with him. Just as in the hymn that we sing, This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up in heaven, as the song says, somewhere beyond the blue. Also, Jesus said to his disciples three verses before that, he said in verse 19, I've chosen you out of the world. He also said three verses before that, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. Peter also says that here, too, in verse 2. He says, we are elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. And any way you slice that word elect, that word means chosen. And that, Peter says here, we were chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. And how is that done? Peter says, through sanctification of the Spirit. That means we were set apart by the Spirit of God, who convicted us of our sin, and he drew us to Christ in recognition that we are sinners who need a Savior. What were we saved for? Peter says right here that we were saved unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Christ. And then he says, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. We were chosen and called out of this world to be children of obedience, Peter says here. We were called unto obedience. For which, Peter says, we were sprinkled with the blood of Christ Not literally, of course, but by placing our faith in the blood of Christ that he shed for us on the cross in atonement for our sin. We have our sins been atoned for. We have been redeemed from our sin and we are now free to serve Christ as as children of obedience. And so uh, Peter says this world is no longer our home. We are now strangers in this world. And does that mean that we're supposed to be strange? 
To non-Christian pagans, yes. It means we are supposed to be. We should appear to be strange to non-Christians because we don't talk like they do. We don't dress like they do. We don't carouse in bars and get drunk like they do. And in general, we are no longer in rebellion against God as they are. To the contrary, we actually go to church whether the government says we're supposed to or not, whether they let us or not. We actually go out to parks and hand out tracts. We go to Walmart and hand out tracts, preach the gospel to others, whether they think it's a hate crime or not. Yeah, we're, we should appear strange. Yeah, we're strangers here. This world is not our home. And so, although Peter does not use the word saint in his introduction to this letter, he is writing here to New Testament saints, to those who are truly saved and born again. He says in the next verse, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope, meaning a living hope, not a dead or a false hope, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Peter says here that the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead gives us assurance. It gives us a living and a lively hope that we too will have eternal life just as he does. And so Peter says in this verse that God the Father according to his abundant mercy, and redeemed us from the due penalty of our sin and forgiven us of all trespasses, has then gone well beyond that in causing us also to be, Peter says, begotten again, born again, regenerated, recreated as new creatures in Christ. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5:17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things pass away and all things become new. That's what Peter means here by we've been begotten again. We're a new creature. As the Lord Jesus said to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Peter says here that was, has been accomplished in our lives. We have been born again. Next, Peter says that because we are born again, chosen and begotten again by God the Father, according to his abundant mercy, he says that we are now new creatures in Christ who have been given a new nature. It's also true then because of that, we have a salvation that is eternally secure, that can never be lost. Amen. Peter says we have a salvation that is eternally secure and that can never be lost. If you're truly saved, you cannot lose true salvation. And that, by the way, is one of the things that distinguishes the true gospel of Christ from all the false gospels and the false religions of this world whether we're talking about Islam or uh, Buddhism or Hinduism or Mormonism or Roman Catholicism or Pentecostalism, none of those false gospels offer any assurance of salvation whatsoever. That assurance only comes through the true gospel that Peter speaks of here, where he says, we have been begotten again, verse 4, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. There is no stronger statement in the Bible of the eternal security that we have in Jesus. And yet many who call themselves Christian due to false teaching or perhaps due to their own pride refuse to accept this glorious truth. I don't know why that is, but the truth is, that is taught here is that once a man is truly saved, true salvation can never be lost. Amen. And this is, itself, of course, is a huge subject that I've covered in other messages, so I'm not going to dwell on the topic today, except to, to point out that every false gospel, including those calling themselves Christian, but that deny the doctrine of the eternal security of the believer, they all rely on man's performance to either save himself or to keep himself saved, which ultimately then becomes salvation by works rather than by grace through faith. Peter says that we are not saved by grace and kept by works. He says in verse 5 that we are kept, how? By the power of God through faith unto salvation. We're not kept for salvation by our own power. We're kept by the power of God unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. And while the man who is consumed with pride and therefore wants to take credit for his own salvation, for his own faith, or perhaps uh, for his own efforts to keep himself saved, 
like the man who left our church over this issue not too long ago, does so for his own pride. I believe when Peter says that we are kept by the power of God through faith, that means even our faith is a gift of God. Even our faith is a gift of God, as Paul also says in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. And so, although Peter is here writing a general epistle to all Christians scattered throughout the empire, most of whom he's never met. He says he's writing to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. He's writing to Christians scattered throughout the entire empire. Remember that most of the Christians that Peter is writing to here, he has never met and probably never will meet. And so although he's writing here a general epistle to all of those, because Peter is writing here to New Testament saints, because he is writing to those who are truly born again, truly saved, eternally secure with a home already reserved for them in heaven, even though he has never met them, he is therefore still able and qualified to make several assumptions about them that he does in the following verses. He says, verse 6, Wherein ye greatly rejoice. He never met them, but he knows that they greatly rejoice. Though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, ye love. How does Peter know that? That's somewhat of an assumption to make, isn't it? And whom, though now you see him not yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Peter is here unashamedly making several assumptions about his intended audience. First of all, because they are truly born again saints of God, Peter presumes that they greatly rejoice in their salvation. And he says that both in verse 6, wherein you greatly rejoice, says also in verse 8. Yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Keeping a marker here in 1 Peter 1. Turn over to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Peter presumes that those of his intended audience greatly rejoice in their salvation. Isn't that quite a presumption for Peter to make about those he's never met before? Well, actually, no, it's not. Since the joy of our salvation should characterize every born-again child of God. Even when we are going through fiery trials, we should all have an overriding joy in our salvation and through all circumstances. And that's why joy itself is one of the first fruits of the Spirit that the Apostle Paul is here in Galatians chapter 5. Talking about the fruit of the Spirit. When a man becomes born again, he becomes indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God, and that Holy Spirit produces fruit in our lives. Amen? Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is, first of all, love. First, he lists love here. Love of the Lord himself, love of God's word, and love of fellow Christians. But then the next fruit of the Spirit he lists is joy. Joy. Joy in all circumstances, no matter what you're going through. We have the joy of knowing that we are eternally secure, that we are on the winning side. Amen? No matter what we're up against. The third fruit he lists here is peace. Because we have been reconciled to God, we now have peace with God. We also, therefore, have peace of mind, and uh, we should uh, display a peaceful spirit as well. We have the fruit of peace, long-suffering, because we've been forgiven of so much. We are now able to forbear long with others and patiently endure their offenses. Amen. Long-suffering. One of Mary's favorite words. Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering. Then he says gentleness, goodness. Faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. This is not an exhaustive list either, by the way, but this is the fruit that the Holy Spirit produces in our lives when we are truly born again. It's a great description, by the way, of the qualities and the character traits that every child of God should exhibit as our new nature, as a product or the work of the Holy Spirit, the influence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And then Paul says, verse 24, And they that are Christ's, have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Back to 1 Peter chapter 1. That, too, is another presumption that Peter makes about his intended audience in this chapter, 1 Peter 1, that they have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. First, he presumes that they are full of joy, and then that they love the Lord Jesus. He says, verse 8, Whom having not seen, ye love. 
Some may think it's presumptuous for Peter to assume his audience loves the Lord Jesus, even when they have not seen him. But as every truly born-again child knows, to know the Lord Jesus as Savior is to love him. Contrary to the false teachings of some easy believest so-called Baptists who flatly deny this undeniable truth, if you have been truly born again, you will love the Lord Jesus. That's why John says in 1 John 4:19, we love him because he first loved us. If you've been saved, you know how much he loved you and gave him gave for you. That's why Jesus himself said in John 8:42, if God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded and came forth from God. Jesus said, if God were your father, you're born from above. If God's your father, if you're truly saved, you would love me. That's also why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 16:22. If any man love not the Lord Jesus, let him be anathema. Anathema, that means accursed. To be marked and avoided as false brethren. Gill says it means to be rejected by the saints and separated from their communion. If any man love not the Lord Jesus, let him be anathema. Marked and avoided. And so Peter rightly presumes then, uh, in verse 8, of the saints that he is writing to, whom having not seen, ye love. In whom, though now you see him not, yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Then in verse 10 to 12, Peter inserts somewhat of a parenthetic side note about how the Old Testament prophets who prophesied of the coming of Christ actually longed to see his coming in their day, uh, but they knew his coming was yet future, uh, to be partially fulfilled and the days of Christ's first advent, but also with much more yet to come in his second, which we now also long for as did those Old Testament prophets. But then Peter returns to the purpose of his writing in verse 13. He says, wherefore, in other words, because, as stated in verse 9, you have received the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Wherefore, Peter says, gird up the loins of your mind. What does that mean? That means don't put your brains and your Bibles on the shelf like, Pentecostals do. All right, we're to use our brains. God gave them to us. He says, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober. Be sober. That means not drunk in the spirit and laughing hysterically like the Pentecostal heretic, so-called Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost bartender, Rodney Howard Brown. Be sober and hope to the end for the grace that's to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That means, of course, has second advent yet to come. Then Peter says, though, verse 14, as obedient children, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the, according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. We need to notice here in verse 14 another presumption that Peter makes of his intended audience. He says here, as obedient children. Notice that Peter is not here admonishing or exhorting his audience to be obedient children. And saying as obedient children, Peter is here expressing an assumed foregone conclusion that because he is writing to true Christians, strangers who have been called out of this world and are truly born again, that they are already Obedient children. He's making that presumption here. Because just as Paul said in Galatians chapter 5, they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. And they did that because they are now obedient children. In other words, they are now children of obedience as opposed to what Paul calls the unbelieving, unregenerate people of this world, referring to them in Ephesians chapter 2 as children of disobedience. Let's go ahead and Turn there. Keep a marker in 1 Peter chapter 1. Turn to Ephesians chapter uh, 2. No, Ephesians chapter 1. Turn to Ephesians chapter 1. I want you to see this in talking about what it means to be a true saint and have true salvation. Paul says in this passage, Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in chapter 1, actually going on into chapter 2, that he prays for the Ephesians there that God would give them a revelation of who they are in Christ or who they should be if they claim to be saved anyway. And what, 
what actually took place when God saved them. Paul prays for them that God would reveal to them what their true calling is. He says, verse 15, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and love unto all the saints, and there's that word there, speaking here, of course, of all Christians, verse 16, Cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. Paul says, I, I just pray that God will re reveal this to you. The eyes of your understanding be enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. That's us, by the way. We're the saints, true saints of God. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand, in the heavenly places. Notice what Paul is saying here. He's saying here that the same, that the power of God that raised Jesus from the dead, in verse 20, is the very same power that is working in us. Just as he raised Christ from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places, so has he also done for us. Look over at chapter 2, verse 1. And you hath he quickened. That word means resurrected. That means raised from the dead. You hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh, and the children of disobedience, among whom we also, among whom also we all, had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were, we were, once, by nature, the children of wrath, even as others. Children of disobedience, children of wrath. But God, but God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace are you saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus." that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. It's a very uh, rich passage of Scripture here. Paul says that we have been raised from spiritual death by the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. Paul says, I, I just pray that God would show this to you. What really took place when you got saved. As born-again saints of God, we used to be children of disobedience. We were walking or living according to the course of this world, following the devil himself, who Paul refers to here as a spirit that worked in the children of disobedience. That's who we used to be. But then, Paul says, But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, by the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, raised us up also from spiritual death. And so now, God the Father, Paul says here, already sees us positionally as though we were even now seated with Jesus in heavenly places. It's amazing, is it not? That's why Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1 that we have an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you. We are already seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Amen. We are kept by the power of God into salvation, ready to, ready to be revealed in the last time. This is what it means to be a true child of God. This is the true gospel, the true salvation that saves the true saints of God. Amen? It's far more than, men, than a mere mental acknowledgement of a few facts of history and merely, merely repeating a sinner's prayer and saying, I'm a Christian now. It's a lot more than that. It's being raised from spiritual death to spiritual life. And now we are no longer children of disobedience. We are now, as Peter says, as obedient children. Children of obedience. Because to be truly born again, saints of God, Jesus is not only our Savior, He is also the very Lord of our life. He, in fact, is our very life. Back to 1 Peter chapter 1. Way back in the 1950s, A.W. Tozer preached a sermon from this passage 
The title of his message was, As Obedient Children. That was the title of his message. He talked in that sermon about how this phrase here in verse 14, as obedient children, contains no verbs. Uh, there's no words of action in that three-word phrase. He said that Peter is not exhorting his audience here to be obedient children, but instead Peter presumes that because they have been born again, they are, by their new nature, already obedient children. And so therefore, as obedient children, then follows the exhortation that they are not to be ignorant. He says, not fashioning yourselves, in verse 14, according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Tozer's sermon was a denunciation and a rebuke of the popular doctrine of his day in the 1950s that said a person could receive Jesus as Savior now and then later on as that person hopefully matures in the faith, later on receive him as Lord and submit to his Lordship. Yeah, the way Tozer described the heresy of his day was that it was a multiple heresy that followed three lines. One, that we are saved by accepting Christ as Savior. Two, that we are sanctified by accepting Christ as Lord. And three, that we can do the first without doing the second. And he said this heresy implies that we can have a divided relationship with Jesus. That he can be our Savior without being our Lord. Or that we can be saved without obeying a sovereign Lord. Tozer pointed out, on the day of Pentecost, Peter preached as follows in Acts chapter 2, verse 36. He said, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Both Lord and Christ. Jesus means Savior. Lord means Sovereign. And Christ means the Anointed King. He is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's not only Jesus. He is the Lord Jesus Christ. And pre Peter preached him as all at once. He never divided the offices of Savior, King, and Lord. Nowhere do you see that in the New Testament. You don't divide those offices. But despite Tozer's and others' masterful preaching against that most heretical view, that false easy believism of Jack Hiles and others of his ilk, Unfortunately, that false view of salvation is just as prevalent today as it was in Tozer's day, promoted by many fools today like Stephen Anderson and others who do not understand the Scriptures and who therefore deny and decry, uh, denounce lordship salvation. However, apart from Christ's lordship, there can be no salvation. There is no salvation without lordship salvation. The Bible does not teach that you can receive Jesus as Savior today and as Lord ten years from now. No one, as told you said, can receive half a Christ or a third or a fraction. We're not saved by believing in an office. We're also, as told you said, not saved by believing on a work. Uh, some say, come and believe on the finished work of Christ. Just believe on the finished work of Christ. The Bible never says that. We are to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ who did that work and who holds those offices. A man who believes on Christ must believe on the whole Lord Jesus Christ without reservation. Amen. The Lord Jesus Christ will not save those who he cannot command and he will not split his offices. You can't believe on half of Jesus. We take Jesus for what he is, King and Savior and Lord. He's King of kings and He's Lord of lords. And He saves us with the understanding that He can also guide our lives as long as we live. And as Tozer said, if a man does not give him that obedience, I have reason to ask if he is saved at all. And that brings us back to what Brother James was teaching last week. Just as Peter had every right to presume that his intended audience of born-again believers uh, were as obedient children... Uh, so do we, conversely, have the right to presume that if a man claims to be a Christian but refuses to obey Christ's clear commands, then that man is not a true child of God. He's not a saint. And that's why, as Brother Jade was teaching last week, John says in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 3, And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. John said, He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments is a liar. 
and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby, John says, know we that we are in him. This is what it means to be a true child of God, to be a saint. This is the true gospel of the true salvation that saves the true saints of God. We'll, I'll break it off there. and We'll go ahead and have a break. Let's go ahead and pray. Father in heaven, Lord, I just uh, pray for all of us that as Paul prayed for the Ephesians, that the eyes of our understanding would also be enlightened as to what you really did for us when you saved us, to what our calling is to be holy, to be obedient children, Lord, to, uh, to reject the allurements of this world and to live for you, to serve you. Help us all, Lord, to live every day in obedience to your Lordship. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.